praise you Lord. Merry Christmas everybody. It's just one week to Christmas. So we're going to sing a couple of Christmas songs. Please join with us. Glory to Jesus. In the sky, the star, the moon. Here we go. In the sky, the stars announce your birth. Sons of God, rejoice to see the King. Of the same, in the sky, in the sky, the stars announce your birth. Sons of God, sons of God, rejoice to see. As the Father promised, great salvation came, life and light revealed the Father's heart. Jesus, I worship you, this blessed Christmas.
exactly the most important thing. The most important thing is that we celebrate him as we bless his name. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Celebration all around. Thank you. Celebrate somebody.
is completely different from Christmas, but um, adds up to the message of a new king born for our salvation. Remember, it's not just about the feasts. It's not just about the celebrations. It's about the fact that Jesus was born to give us new life. He was born to save us. And he was born to make us the God kind. We are no longer humankind. We are the God kind. So I'm going to teach you on honey. Eat honey and your spiritual eyes will open up. This is the order of the bee. All right? The Spirit of God was speaking to me throughout the week. And he was telling me to teach his people about the significance of honey. So during this Christmas, as you eat your chicken and your turkey and your, your burger and whatever, the things that you like to eat, um, take some honey too. Okay? Now... I want to talk to you about the bee and the significance of the bee and the significance of the honey because you are prophetic people. Jesus Christ was born and he died to give birth to a new church and that church is a prophetic church. It's a church that operates in the supernatural. So the word bee is taken from the Hebrew dabar, D-A-B-A-R, which means to speak forth. Do you see that? To speak forth, to declare, to converse, to command, to promise, to warn, or even to threaten. You see that? To speak for. So that's where we get the word be from. Dabar, to speak for. Remember, Jesus Christ is the word. So even as we celebrate his birthday, we are celebrating the birthday of the word. The word that spoke it forth. The Rema word. The word that has power. Okay? Remember, when you read the word of God, you get logos. When you believe in it and meditate upon it, and then you speak it, it becomes Rema. When you read the word of God, it's logos. For example, if you say, if you read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fall, that's logos. It has no power. It's just information. But when you start speaking it forth as an inspired word of life, Jesus, you are my shepherd. For that reason, I shall not want. Even if there are difficulties or issues around me, I shall not want because I have a, a, a savior and a shepherd in you. You see, now I've turned Psalm 23 to Rema. That's the bar. That's the B. The order of the B. Are you getting it? Mm. Now the word the bar is used when God spoke to Moses, commanding him to impart his prophetic gift upon the 70 elders of Israel. So in Numbers 11, 25, the Bible says, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto, and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. How powerful. So, Numbers 11.25 says, The Lord came in a cloud, came down in a cloud, and dabar unto Moses. He dabar, the word where we get B from. He dabar, okay, unto Moses. Uh, and he spoke forth. He conversed with him. He commanded him. He gave him a, a, a promise, yeah? And when Moses believed that logos, the word that God spoke to him, and he declared it upon the 70 elders of the Israelites. The Bible says the spirit that was upon Moses rested upon them and they began to prophesy. That's what's going to happen to you this Christmas. The spirit of God that is upon my life, based on the word that he gave me, that the bar he gave me, is resting upon you right now. And you're going to prophesy. Why is it important to prophesy? You will not make it financially unless with a prophetic tongue. You cannot make it in marriage. You cannot make it in anything unless you have a prophetic ability to speak forth. All right? You cannot succeed unless you're able to speak things forth, all right? So do you realize that the Spirit didn't come from God, but was taken from Moses? Because human beings have been given the mandate to rule the earth. So if we don't say, be filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to be filled. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. That's why it's important for you to, de to, to connect to that special man or woman of God that God has given you, and to listen to them, and to pay attention to the words that they speak. Because God is not going to come to you, to reveal to you certain things. He will send you a man or send you a woman. And when God has sent you that person, please honor them, respect them, listen to them, you know, hear their words, they will help you, okay? So the spirit that God brings to me for your prosperity can only rest upon you when I debar the order of the bee now, when I speak it forth to you. But I can also warn you because a bee also stands for warning, okay? Now, uh, so you have something to offer. Because if it's been given to you, you can give it away. The Bible says you can only love people if you can love yourself. The most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, in this world is to improve yourself first. When you have improved yourself, it will be easier to improve others. 
love yourself, be kind to yourself, do good things to yourself, then it will be easy for you to do good things to other people. Have you noticed haters out in the world, the haters that are out there in the world, are people who hate themselves. They hate themselves first, so they become dispensers of hatred. If you could only love yourself, you would also have the capacity to love other people. So we release the bar upon you. The ability to hear, the ability to speak for, the ability to operate in authority. And once that has become uh, center or centered within your life, it will be easy for you to do the same to other people. In Colossians 4 verse 6, the Bible says, let your speech be always, be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. If somebody comes and they have a, a need, you should have an answer for them. Even if that need is something that has to do with entrepreneurship, you need to have your speech seasoned with salt. So the name Deborah, who was uh, the prophetess in Israel, remember the days when Jabin attacked Israel and Sisera was scared, uh, started running away and Jael killed Sisera and Jabin was defeated. It is Deborah, the prophetess, that God used to bring such great victory to Israel. She was so powerful, that woman, that she even commanded stars to fight against Sisera. In the book of Judges chapter 5, you'll find she says that the stars and the forces above fought against Sisera and on the earth there was victory. You see, you need to be prophetic to win battles. You need to be prophetic for this Christmas season to make any sense to you. You need to be prophetic for the birth of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, his glorification and his soon coming. If those are to be of significance, you need to be a prophetic person, a person who understands spiritual things. Because the Bible says the carnal mind is contrary to the things of God. That the carnal mind cannot be subject to the things of God. But the spiritual mind understands them. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Okay? So I could be speaking to a carnal person and they'll actually mock it. They'll think, oh, look at this guy. It doesn't make sense. Because you're carnal. These things are for the initiated. It's like if I were to speak to you in tongues, you don't understand the thing. But if you're initiated in that realm, then you'll appreciate the tongues I speak. So if I'm not making sense to your carnal, all right? And carnal people die and they go to hell. So you need to give your life to Jesus Christ so that you can become a spiritual person. Or if you used to be a, a Christian and you got hurt and you got discouraged and now this, your work is just to criticize ministers, return to God. Because you make mistakes too. Don't think that it's only ministers who make mistakes. Even you hurt people. Even you let people down. How wouldn't you let your family down? Weren't you called to be the leader of your family, providing for your family, and right now you can't even provide for your own self, and your mouth is also critical of it. You see, I'm a prophet, so I'm speaking to somebody who gave up on the things of God because a preacher hurt you. Nowadays, your work is just to criticize. You failed in everything, every aspect of your life. If you were to just return to Jesus, forgive those who hurt you, and stop having a critical tongue, start building instead of destroying, you will succeed again, and God will use you to build your family. And to build your empire because you're created for greatness, okay? Now, the name Deborah is mentioned only twice in the Bible. The first, um, uh, the first one is Rebecca's nurse. Rebecca had a nurse. Remember Rebecca, the wife of Isaac? He had, uh, she had a nurse and, and that nurse was called Deborah. And the second time is when Deborah is mentioned as the prophetess. So in Genesis 35 verse 8, the Bible says, but Deborah which is the word be, okay? And the bar, which is to speak forth, to warn, to converse, and all those things are derived from um, Deborah, that is a bee. So, uh, but Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried beneath Bethel and an oak, and the name of it was called Alon Bahuf, okay? Alon Bahuf, an oak tree is Alon, Alon, A L L. O -M, okay, very similar to my name Helen. Okay, my name Helen is strength, but it's alone or the strength of an oak. Yeah, uh, alone, bakuf. Okay, so that's the first time the the word B is used in the Bible as a nurse to who Rebecca, who was going to be the mother of Jacob, the mother of Israel. Do you see how God connects these things? Mm -hmm. So the one who nurses the mother of Israel is called a B. Because you need the word for such a thing to happen. Now, in Judges 4 verse 4, the Bible says, And Deborah, or a bee, a prophetess, the wife of Lapido, she judged Israel at that time. Isn't that beautiful? So in the prophetic realm, a bee stands for God's spoken word. A bee also stands for the office of a prophet. So a bee stands for a warning as well. A bee also stands for a threat. So 
in the prophetic realm, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand Jesus. If you see Jesus in the prophetic realm, you'll, it will make much more sense relating to him. But if you just see him as somebody to be worshipped alone, then you'll not have a proper relationship with him. Jesus is prophetic. Everything about him was prophetic and still is prophetic. And to relate to him properly, you need to understand prophetic symbols or prophetic codes. Okay? Kandi is a code. Now, uh, so you've got to understand, if you see a bee anywhere, in a hive or moving from one flower to another, then you need to know God is speaking to you. Okay? Like Deborah. There's a prophetic message God is giving to you. So pay attention. Start talking in tongues to find out what God is talking. But a bee could also be a warning. God is warning you about something. The same thing happens with a dragonfly. If you are moving somewhere, a dragonfly comes to your face or in front of your car and flies in front of your car for a while before it goes away, God is warning you about something. There's a warning or a threat. A warning or a threat. Begin to pray in tongues and begin to counsel anything contrary to God's word or God's will in your life. Okay? Or wherever you're going. Very significant. But a be also stand for God's word. God is talking to you. So at that particular moment, tune yourself to the things of God. If you are listening to radio full of gossip and all that, get to worship. So that your spirit is in tune Okay, so that it's in tune with the voice of God. Then you may tune into a worship station on your radio or whatever, or put in a worship um, MP3 or something, and you'll hear the words of the song giving you the message that God wanted you to hear, or giving you the warning that the B stood for. You get that? Mm -hmm. And a B also stands for a promise. There's something God has promised you, but the promises of God will not come to pass unless you speak them forth. Like salvation is a promise. It's also a gift. But you won't get it until you speak it forth. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, then you'll get saved. So if God has promised you prosperity and you're there just listening to your own thing, you know, you're listening to some rap music and you're bopping your head and you're so happy driving your car, you know, and then you see a bee, hey, say, oh, God is talking to me. There's a warning. There's a message. There's a conversation God wants with me. And if you tune yourself to the things of God, you start remembering scriptures. And those scriptures will be prophetic messages God is giving you. And when you speak them forth, you're going to have success wherever you'll be going. You'll avert disaster or some form of danger wherever you're going. I've seen people get into cars and end up in accidents. Yet God warned them right from home. You got into that car, there was a puncture. You got out. As you're living like this, the battery refuses to work. You know, <laughs> you, re you recharge your battery, jump, stamp. The you are so stubborn, you just have to go to an accident. Yeah? You see, there are things that God does to warn you. If you could just be aware of your environment, you should pray and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, what should I do? The Spirit of God will tell you, wait for 30 minutes. So that whatever that truck that was going to bash onto you to kill you passes. So that the word is clear for you. Okay? Are you getting that? So you're going to be a person in tune with the things of God. That's why it's important to take honey literally. It brightens your eyes. It enlightens you so that you get to understand prophetic things. I'll get to that. Okay? A bee also stands for what? Order. You know bees are orderly in their operations. Yeah? They stand for administration and teamwork. So you may see a bee and you're about to just leave a group of people that God sent you to. That bee should send you right back home as a warning and a threat. Yeah? Mm. All right. A husband is about to walk out on a wife. And as he's getting into the car, there's a bee in the car. So as you're trying to sort it and to get rid of it, because you also fear you might be stung, the Lord is telling you that the decision you're going to make will sting you. Okay? Go back to your wife, you rascal. Okay? <laughs> Do you see? God speaks in such simple ways. So this Christmas, please. Let the word of God be born in your heart. And may you hear him talk to you clearly so that you don't abandon a beautiful woman just because she made one or two mistakes. And you woman, you don't walk out on a man just because he got drunk and messed up, but he's sorry. He's willing to work on it. Of course, there are people who are supposed to leave, people who are dangerous, and violent, people that can, can harm you. But not everybody's dangerous and violent, but people make mistakes. And there you are, you packed your things, you're about to go, and the bee won't leave you. 
It's just hovering around you, hovering around you. God is warning you. God is saying you're making a big mistake. Go back home. Yeah? Go back home and rectify matters. Say sorry. Give it time. Don't make decisions when you're angry. You'll always be the fool. Let me tell you. If you ever make any significant decision in anger, after a week or two, you will be the fool. And you'll feel it. You'll see how foolish you are. Give it time. Let the bee warn you. Take some honey. Okay? Glory to God. All right? So bees also stand for industriousness and success. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. The yellow on the bee stands for healing. And the black on the bee stands for revelations. It's got black and yellow, right? The nectar that they use yeah, and the flowers they, they forage stand for success, prosperity, and maturity. You see that? When a flower blows on, it means that flower is mature. The rose that blows on is mature. That is the height of its purpose. Blows on it. Okay? And that's when the bee comes in. Maturity. You get that? Success. Prosperity. Yeah, they also stand for beauty. Bees also stand for entrepreneurship and business acumen. Yeah? They stand for beauty. They stand for entrepreneurship, business acumen. Did you know that the wax that bees make from their glands inside which they create the honey and then they lay the egg to take care of the next generation of the bees. And that thing is a hexagon. A what? A hexagon, right? Yeah. yeah? Six sides. Mm. You know six stands for humanity. Yeah? Mm. And that, the fact that it's such a structured shape, by the way, it's uh, geometrically sound. It is done so correctly. So bees also stand for precision. Yeah, and they stand. They stand for a resilient generation. You cannot stop. They make so much honey that there is enough for their children and enough for all of us to eat and to trade in. Just think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that the Bora generation are those who make so much money that there is enough for them and enough for other people. Do you see? God never gives you anything in measure. He does not give in measure. He gives you in super abundance. So God is going to prosper you this Christmas. Mm. You're going to make so much money. And the promises of great financial success will come upon you after I finish talking to you. Such that you'll be so prosperous that not only will you take care of yourself and your family, but you'll take care of other people as well. That's how bees operate. You see? So when you see a bee next time, you better stop on your tracks and think of these messages. Okay? Now, in a negative sense, a bee can mean a threat or a warning, but all you need to do is apply uh, the meanings of the word dabar, okay? Instead of being afraid of any form of a threat. So the bee can be seen as a threat, danger, warning, because of its sting. Now in the Bible, a sting stands for sin that leads to death. It also means the letter of the law. So when witches attack, they tend to use bees in, in a negative sense. They release bees on your picture. Or they release bees towards your direction. Spiritually. And then in the natural realm, you wake up and you're feeling sick. And some people have even died. They can sting your business too. They can sting your marriage. They can sting your family. They can sting anything. When used in a negative sense. But now I'm going to give you scriptures that will help you deal with that. Second Corinthians 3 verse 6 says, Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. So the law, a person who is under the law is always a bitter person. They use the Bible to attack. And when you use the Bible that way, that word kills you. If you read the Bible and all you experience is guilt, that letter of the law, that grammar is killing you. But the Spirit is supposed to give you life, which is why though the bee stings, what the bee produces can be used to preserve. You see, in the old days, the, the pharaohs, and the like, they used to preserve corpses in honey. They just cover the corpse in honey. Because bacteria cannot operate in honey. You know that? Pathogens cannot operate where there is honey. So honey was used to preserve things. And the Lord preserves you from evil and from danger. Do you see? So instead of looking at the sting, look for the preservation. Instead of looking for the sting, look for the sweetness. Instead of looking for the sting, yeah, look for propagation of prosperity. Because bees operate pollination. They aid with pollination. Without bees, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot have vegetables, we can't have plants, we can't have grass, we can't have anything. You see? 
So with that anointing, you really become the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You really become the person the world depends on. So you can't afford to sit there feeling depressed, feeling like a loser. When God has given you so much and when so many people are waiting for you to rise to the light of your awakening. Glory to Jesus. Yeah. First Corinthians 15, 55 to 56 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? You see, the sting stands for death. Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is in the law. So if you get away from the law, trying to work hard to please God when he's already pleased, that's what the law is, trying to please God, then he's already pleased. Then instead, appreciate and accept his love for you, even if you're wrong. Accept his love and forgiveness. Accept the fact that God loves you. That's what we call grace. If you are guilty, every time you come before God, you're being stung by the law. The sting is death. The law is killing you. But if you reject that guilt, it doesn't matter what you've done. Remember, your guilt is not going to wash you. There's a song that says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your guilt won't wash it. The blood will. Okay? It's like feeling guilty that you didn't cook. That's not going to feed you. What will feed you is cook. And if you don't have the food, go to your neighbor and humble yourself and ask for food. Don't feel guilty. What if you felt guilty that you failed an examination? Will that guilt cause you to pass it? If you go back to study the same thing and you do the exam the second time, you might just pass it. So you see how guilt wastes your time. Guilt is a sign you're being stung by the law. The spirit of death is really in operation in your life. Reject it and accept grace, accept love, accept forgiveness, accept the fact that God has given you many, many more chances. That's why God told Peter to operate code 490, the code of forgiveness. Yeah, Forgiving 70 times 7, 490, 490 stands for forgiveness. Okay, number four stands for forgiveness. Number nine stands for forgiveness. Okay, 490 forgiveness. Seven times 70, okay? It's not so powerful that God will use seven, 70 times to depict how important it is to forgive people. So forgive yourself too. What bad thing did you do? Have you forgiven yourself? Get out of the sting of the bee and go for the honey, okay? Glory to God. Move away from bitterness. Go to sweetness. See bitterness, somebody stung by the law. People who are bitter, resentful. These toxic people, they're stung by the law. Yeah, that's why they're so critical. They criticize everybody. Get away from bitterness. Honey is sweet. Okay. You can get bitterness within that comb. They can sting you. But you can also get the food. All right. Now, honey is the Hebrew word debash. It means to be sticky or gummy. Spiritually stands for the word of God. The revealed word of God. Israel walked through the wilderness by the word of God. It's by the word that they walked through the wilderness. They sucked honey, the Bible says, out of a rock. Yeah? And that rock was Jesus. So the word Jesus is honey or debash. Also stands for prosperity. Yeah? Now in Deuteronomy 32 verse 13, the Bible says, He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him suck honey, debash, out of the rock and oil out of the plenty rock. Okay? Now, good speech and wise use of words is also likened to honey. In Song of Songs 4 verse 11, the Bible says, Song of Songs 4 11, Your lips drip honey, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The scent of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Wow. Did you hear that? This man is talking to a woman. Now, you woman watching me right now, when you open your mouth to speak, does your mouth drip honey? Does milk and honey come out of your mouth. In other words, when you open your mouth to speak, do you speak sweet words or do you speak words that are bitter? Words that smack or being stung by the bee? What do you speak? Practice to speak sweet words. Words of encouragement. Words of endearment. Don't speak careless words. All right? Honey stands for moderation and balance in doing things. It also stands for glory. The Bible says that too much honey can cause one to vomit, yeah? And chasing one's own glory, you know, being conceited, is likened to eating too much honey as well. It's called vanity. So notice that this is only with regards to personal relationships and not in the volume of the word of God that one reads. This is just in regard to relationships. So you must devour God's word at all times. 
So don't say, oh, I'm not going to take too much of God's word because the Bible says I shouldn't take too much honey. No. What we mean here is this. Don't do certain things in excess when dealing with people. Yeah. For example, um, uh, the Bible talks about a person who keeps going to the neighbor to ask for things. Yeah. Every time they see you, they feel uncomfortable because they know you're going to ask them for something. Or have you ever found a friend? Have you ever seen or have you experienced a friend who every time they call you or text you, they're asking you for money? Every time. There's nothing good they'll ever tell you. It's money. Hi, how are you? How was your day? Hmm. The next text message. So, I need some help. What help? But that's the story. Such a person is eating too much honey because you will get so tired of them, you block them. Yeah? You see? So, you've got to be moderate in the things you do. This is not within the family setting. In the family setting, all my money belongs to my wife and all of my wife's money belongs to me because the Bible says we are no longer two but one. I've had some people telling couples, like, oh, make sure you have your own bank account and uh, you, you never know, you never know. So, why did you get into marriage with suspicion? Get out. You're married to a suspect. Yeah? Get out. Why do you marry somebody and then begin suspecting them? You're a fool. Did you not do your due diligence before marrying them? Did you not find out that in their family they're wizards, they run at night, and now you're married to them, and then this person is stripped naked and is running on the spot because he's afraid of the police officers out there. He's jogging on the spot, stuck naked, because in the family they're wizards, you know. Did you not find out before then? And, and if you still insisted on marrying a person like that, why don't you get them delivered from the spirit of wizardry? So that they sleep at night and do athletics in the day. Olympics, yeah? The people who run and they're not running for any medal, you know. The Bible calls it vanity, chasing after the wind. Yeah? It's a demonic problem. Look, do due diligence so that when you get into a marriage, you're marrying flesh of your flesh and bones of your bones. You're no longer two people but one. So you cannot have financial suspicion. You can't start saying, what if she runs away with my money? What if he runs away with my money? Then marry the money. It looks like marry, money is a better husband or wife than a person to you. Why do you get into something you suspect? Why do you get into something you hate? Are you a fool or what? Yeah? I hate my job. Quit! Get a job you like. Why are you still there? Monday to Friday. I hate this job. Monday to You're singing the refrain of the song of fools. Not the song of song. Yeah? I hate this job. Get out if you hate it. You choose something Make yourself like it. I chose my wife. I make myself love her. It's not about how I feel. It's about what the Bible says I should do. Yeah. Do you realize that forgiving is not, is not automatic? You make yourself forgive. It's more natural to revenge. So a person who is operating in the spirit completely overrules the flesh, that desire to revenge. And then you engage the spiritual power of forgiveness. And that's how marriages work. It is forgiveness upon forgiveness. By the way, it's our 21st wedding anniversary. That occurred on the 15th, this last week, on Thursday, yes. So we're going to celebrate our wedding, wedding anniversary all the way to Christmas, up to next year. I think we should celebrate the whole year, until yeah. the next 15th <laughs> of December, yeah? Mm. Now, how have we been able to handle 21 years of marriage and plus another six years. We've got married after six years of courtship. So that's 27 years. How have we been able to handle that? It's through forgiveness. I remember as teenagers, we sat with my wife, Annie's literally. Yeah. And we said, we are entering into this thing ready to forgive any and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? We said, we are in this thing for keeps. Mm -hmm. We were not planning to walk away no matter what. So they keep asking us, why do you guys keep smiling? Because it's beautiful. We also make ourselves smile. The mouth is mine. The teeth are mine. The facial features and expressions are mine. I can move them in certain ways that make me look like, it, you know, that I have got the most beautiful smile. You know, you can't pretend for long. Yeah. Just try smiling right now. Just try smile. Smile right now. Within five seconds, your feelings are going to start becoming positive, even if you're angry. Yeah? So make yourself do good things. Operate the honey and not the sting. Okay? 
Are you getting me? You wonderful people. Mm. Yeah. So have you found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled out with a vomit. Yeah. Song of Songs. Um, Ecclesiastes. Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. Solomon gave some very good advice. Don't try to be too nice. Okay? And don't be wicked either. That means, don't think that by being nice to somebody, they'll be nice back to you. The people that will hurt you in life are people you'll be nice to, not people you'll be bad to. Yeah? I'm not saying be bad to anybody. I'm preparing you so that when a person you are kind to turns against you, you don't think that something strange is happening to you. So people will return evil when you've given them good, but be good anyway. Because the Bible says we overcome evil with good. Okay? Proverbs 25 verse 27 says, It's not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. So vanity, saber rattling, chest thumping, trying to make yourself more important than you, than you should, and stuff like that. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought is like eating too much honey. So you see how the Bible works symbolically. So honey stands for a promise of peace, rest, and prosperity. It also stands for conquest and victory. So milk and honey characterize the promise God gave to his people when they left Egypt. If you look at Exodus 3 verse 8, the Bible says, And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, God talks to Moses, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and unto a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Remember, milk stands for the word of God that is given to those who just got saved. Like, since, like, like, like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by, the Bible says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a land of the word of God in its inception and the revelation of the word. The speech, the tabah, prophecy. Okay? That's why the, Israel, the nation of Israel is a nation of prophets. Okay? A land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. You see, so when Jesus conquered death, he came, he became Rema for us. Rema. So this is like the honey that came out of the carcass, the honey that came out, out of the carcass of a lion that Samson killed. Remember the story? In Judges 14 verse 8, Samson was going to look for a wife and a young lion roared against him. He, with his bare hands, he just tore the lion like that and destroyed it. And then when he was returning, he found honey on the lion. Okay? So Judges 14 verse 8, And after a time, he returned to take her, as in he returned to get the woman he had gone to woo. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Okay? So the lion stand for Jesus that was slain to produce honey. Are you getting it? The lion of the tribe of Judah that was slain by the Jewish people, of course by the Romans people, having been framed by the Jewish people, he was killed and honey came out of him. Are you getting that? Mm. So throughout the Bible, God teaches the Israelites that Jesus will be killed. He will be sacrificed. And then he will resurrect and he will give us life. You see? Mm. All right. So honey is prophetic food. The one who eats it chooses good but avoids evil. Jesus literally ate honey. Literally. If you make eating honey with its comb your habit, ladies and gentlemen, your prophetic eyes will get enlightened and you will start seeing in the spirit. Isaiah 7 verse 15 says, Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. Literally, eating honey is good for your health, but it's also good for your spiritual health. It enables you to choose what is sweet and good and to avoid what is bitter. Are you getting that? Mm. Yeah? Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. eat honey and you'll choose good and you'll avoid evil. That's what Jesus literally did. Do you remember John the Baptist eating honey and locusts? Mm. He ate honey. Prophets eat honey literally. Prophets walk around with honey in their bags and once in a while they take it and eat it, especially before they speak. So that that prophetic act of putting something sweet upon your tongue will cause the words you speak to be palatable and acceptable to the hearers. You get that? Mm. Uh-huh. Very significant. You say, oh, 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 what do you mean? Okay. Try weed them and see if it won't work. Try it. If honey is not going to work, if honey is not going to bring something sweet in your life, and the Bible actually says it, 
Smoke a joint of weed and see if you're not going to become very prophetic. Except not in the negative sense. Food stuff, things that enter through our mouth, will affect us spiritually. Ladies and gentlemen, they do. Okay? So milk, butter, and honey are prophetic foods that activate people's spiritual senses. <coughs> much like wine makes one drunk. You see that? Yeah? He say, I'm saved. I will talk in that. Rika, prendo, sapra, etere, mandro, progesta, braca. A glass of wine. Rindara, prendo, sacla, second one. Before you know it, you'll be talking tongues like a drunkard. He's a good God. No, I'm not drunk. I'm very holy. I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm, I'm a tongue drinking. Demon chasing, dead raising, sort of winning, uh, 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 Christian. Mm. All right, and I'm more intelligent than all of you. <laughs> Drunk people just think they're cleverer than everyone. <laughs> no, I'm not angry. No, I'm not braggadocious. I'm very humble. You know. <laughs> so. <laughs> You say that food doesn't have any spiritual consequence. Try too much alcohol and see if you want susu on yourself. It's a prophetic thing. Because you think you're in the toilet. You're in, in the spiritual realm until you think you're there by the urino, actually urinating. And you do it on yourself. And you look at yourself and you wonder, what is that breeze that I'm feeling? Holy <laughs> That's being in the prophetic realm where the body is no longer in charge. It's the spirit in charge. Mm. You see that? So when you eat the right food, the food that Jesus himself ate, you'll find yourself operating the way he operated. So that's why Isaiah 7.15 says, Eat honey, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That's why the Israelites were told, you're going to a land full of what? Milk and honey. So when you take that, you will start following God instead of following what's evil. Okay? Now, Jonathan brought great success to the Israelites during war. There was a certain time when there was so much war. Yeah? And Jonathan and his servant went to some place. Yeah? And they defeated the entire army, the two of them, because they ate honey that enlightened their eyes to see God's strategy for victory. Foods that are good for strategy. One of them is honey. Another one is dates. Another one is figs. Foods that you need to eat for strategy. Fish. Okay? Eat meat after, not before. If you eat meat before, you're not going to have any strategy. Fish is good for strategy. Chicken is good for strategy. I can give you scriptures for all these. What is it that made Peter realize that he had denied Jesus. What? Wasn't it a chicken? <laughs> you deny me thrice. Before the cock talks to you, saying, You just deny the Lord. Ooh. You know, cock a doodle doo. Ooh. He denied the Lord. Ooh. You see, that crowing of the cock was not based on timing because. Cocks tend to crow at about five. And then, you know, they, 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 they tend to, to crow during the watches of the day. But this one was a specific crowing to give Peter prophetic word. That betrayal has happened so that he could repent. So there are foods that are good for, <laughs> for strategy. Okay, They're also good for your health. Yeah, so if you just, just now if you deep fry chicken, that's trouble now. That chicken will betray you. Yeah? If you eat fast food, chicken and, ch and fries, chicken and fries, that, that's now betrayal for your, for your life. Okay? Well, one of these fun days I'll teach you about prophetic foods, but today I'm focusing on honey. Yeah? In 1 Samuel 14, verse 27, the Bible says, But Jonathan heard not when his father chided the people with the oath. Wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb, and he put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. After eating that honey, he went and defeated the enemy. Let me tell you something that I do when people turn against me and things are thick. I eat honey. You know what happens? The bees sting them and my eyes open up and I get my victory. 
before I go to court, because in real estate, we are ever going to court. I take honey. By the time the judge is done, they'll only say sweet things about my case. Okay, I've given you a strategy. All right. That's why I win all the time, not some of the times. All the time. I win all battles. I've never lost a single battle. Okay? You may think, oh, it's going down, it's going down. No. It's going down. It's going down. All right? It's not he is going down. No. It's going down. It's going down. And I get my victory. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Okay? Eat honey literally. Just like if you want to get drunk, take a lot of alcohol or weed. These things work spiritually. Yeah? Why is that when somebody is taking weed? Back and forth for them is the same. Moving forward and moving backwards is one and the same thing. It makes them like those cherubim. Remember them? That have eyes all over. <laughs> you know? These things open your eyes. Just like when they ate the fruit, honey. Remember, in the garden. Mm -hmm. The Bible says their eyes were enlightened. Mm -hmm. The sweetness of sugar enlightens your eyes. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Food is a prophetic thing. Food is a spirit of life. That's why when you eat it, it gives life to your physical body. Why is that medicine comes from herbs, from plants? Because plants have a spirit. Just like cannabis sativa is a spirit. Yeah. So, curative medicines are spirits that have authority over life and death. That's why if you overdose, you die. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. If you take the right dosage, you live. Are you seeing this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the Bible has so much wisdom for you. You'll understand why they extract medicinal uh, unguents and properties from herbs. Yeah? Glory to God. All right, let's carry on. Now, Jonathan eats honey and defeats the Philistines. Even though the father had said, nobody eats from morning to evening. The devil was using the father. But Jonathan wasn't there. The Lord ensured he was not there to hear that message. Otherwise, he would not have eaten the honey and he would have been defeated. But he ate the honey. The Bible says his eyes were enlightened. And then what happened? He defeated the Philistines. So eating honey gives you victory. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that their eyes should be enlightened. Ephesians 1 verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So the enlightenment of the eyes means that you are filled with light, which is the word of God. Okay? That light makes your eyes single and brilliantly prophetic. Wow. So you'll know what to do with cryptocurrency. You'll know what to do with all this, uh, uh, the world of the metaverse, the world of uh, blockchain. You'll know what to do with business. You'll know what to do with clients because your eyes are enlightened. You see what other people don't see. Okay? Glory to God. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no success about the prophetic gift. There are people who are prophetic, but they are not saved. But see, the callings and giftings of God are without repentance. If he gives you a gift, he leaves it with you whether you're going to serve him or not. So if you find somebody who's very good in business or very good in anything, they have a prophetic gift. What if they served God with that gift? Would there not be, wouldn't, wouldn't that be much better? Yeah? Matthew 6, 22-23 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. Okay? But if your eye be evil, what is an evil eye? You only see what's wrong with people. That's an evil eye. You stain people. You operate by the law. What does the law do? The law shows you that you're wrong. That's an evil eye. There are those who are practicing until it's a, a, a prophetic calling. They look at you and you fall sick. Yeah? We look at you and you get well. We can heal you by just giving you a look. Okay? Because our eyes are single and our bodies are full of light. Glory to God. A single eye is an eye that is based on God's word. That is singularly focused on God's word. An evil eye is an eye that looks at too many things. The word at some time and what's wrong with you at other times. Some envy. Yeah. You, you know about the green what? It's called the green monster? Mm -hmm. The one that turns green with envy. Mm -hmm. They look at you and they see how successful you are and they feel bad about it. They look at you to see how beautiful you are. They feel horrible about it. So they have to tear you down. They can't believe you could succeed like that. Yet they knew that at some point in life, you are probably a rascal. You're probably so horrible. Where, where did you get all your success from? 
Why am I not being as successful as you? Yet, I've never done all the crazy things you've done. The green monster, right? Green-eyed monster. The demon of envy and jealousy is green and has only one eye. Yeah? Big eye that's green. Okay? And that eye is always looking at who should we tear down? Who got married recently? We say, oh, you married a woman much older than you. Who? Who? <laughs> There's nothing they ever accept. You change your hairstyle. No, that hairstyle does not fit you. Yeah? Do your buttocks fit you? Do they? Come on. What is handsome? That hairstyle doesn't fit you. Do your buttocks fit you? Huh? Come on. If you want anything to fit you, the first thing you must do is accept it as it is. Then you start improving it. You get that? Accept it first, then improve it. All right? Are you getting that? So if your eye is evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? So critics, negative programmers, get naysayers, haters, name them. You see, social media has exposed them. Because social media gives you expression. And the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So social media enables us to know what's in people's hearts. You see? So there are people with evil eyes. Glory to God. Now, angels eat honey. Did you know that? You know that angels actually eat? <laughs> God gave the same to the Israelites in the wilderness. And they called it, what is this? Or in Hebrew, manna. Yeah? Exodus 16 verse 31, the Bible says, And the house of Israel called the name there of manna. And it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Okay. How do I know that angels ate that stuff? Psalm 78 verse 24 to 25. And had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, the bread of heaven. What is eaten in heaven? Man did eat angels' food. He sent the meat to the full. So when you eat honey, you're eating angels' food. That's why angels are so knowledgeable because of what they eat. Now you know that coriander seed is good for you. Now you know that nuts are good for you. Those are prophetic foods, okay? <laughs> All right. Do you know what eating of a nut stands for in the prophetic realm? Yeah? It's like breaking the coconut. If you break it, there's a breakthrough. Yeah? The moment the thing is broken like this and you get the nut that's within, there's a breakthrough. Did you know that the water within the coconut is the same as your blood plasma? And it can be dripped, it can be used as drip if somebody's dehydrated. It can be used as drip or if somebody has bled directly, intravenously from the coconut fruit itself. That liquid can be injected in your system and used as drip. Did you know that? So when that thing comes, it's like bleeding. Which is why the coconut thing is like the womb of a woman. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. One of these fun days I'll teach you. How to liken the natural things to how the human body functions. So you'll find a lot of Indians who understand spiritual things. You'll always find them breaking coconuts. They always have coconuts everywhere. Anyway. Uh, and that's also why they defeat you in business. Alright. Let's carry on. So God rained upon them the food of the angels. Proverbs 24 verse 13 to 14. My son, eat honey because it's good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto your soul. Hear that. Eat it. So that the knowledge of wisdom shall be unto your soul. When you found it, then there shall be a reward. And your expectations shall not be cut off. So when I'm going for a business deal, my expectations are not cut off. I'll get my reward. Because I already ate honey. Oh, oh, oh. I just don't walk into business like a fool. Come on. I don't go into any transaction like a fool. Because I lose out. I make sure I've eaten the right things before I go there. Okay? And honey is one of them. One or two spoons of honey. Mmm. Then I talk in tongues. By the time I'm going for the business deal, approve, approve, approve. Everything is approved. Yeah? 
<laughs> I walk out of that place with a bounce on my steps. I'm much taller than I usually am. I'm not, I'm not a tall guy, but when I'm walking out of those places, I'm towering, I'm telling you. Yeah. Then you wonder, how come his things always work? Even if you try to set me up for failure, honey will deal with you. Okay? <laughs> I will walk out with the money. Oh, yes, I will. I will sell what you thought could never be sold. Huh? I just keep eating honey until it sells. <laughs> you people. That this man is, is preaching strange things. Did I come here to... to preach to you obscure and normal and pedestrian things. I'm operating in the prophetic realm, okay? Amen. You get that? In Song of Songs, the groom who stands for Jesus talks of eating honey and honeycomb. Song of Songs, 5 verse 1. I'm coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my ma with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, oh friends, drink. Yeah, drink abundantly, oh beloved. Look at that. This is a good marriage, isn't it? They are drinking wine. They are eating good things. They are smelling nice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but the most important thing here is that the groom is eating honey. So that by the time he's calling the wife honey, they were called mine. Things are sweet for real. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you fight with somebody, take honey first before you text them. <laughs> I'm giving you prophetic codes. I must have loved. That somebody's not talking to you. Things are thick. Just keep eating honey. In a short while, they start feeling sweet feelings towards you. Glory to God. Yeah? That, oh, my husband doesn't love me anymore. You know, things are not as sweet as they used to be. He used to call me sweetheart. Nowadays, he just calls me mama this, mama that. Or he just says you. Then I wait, you. <laughs> yeah? So, <laughs> even you. That's how you're called. Huh? Take a little honey and give him honey too. Things will change, okay? Ezekiel ate the roll that contained the word of God and he tasted like honey to his mouth. Then he spit the word of God as prophecy to the Israelites. In Ezekiel 3 verse 1 to 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go and speak unto the house of Israel. He ate honey. The word tasted like honey. Verse 2, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause your belly to eat and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. So apart from the symbolic meanings of honey, honey as food itself is the food, one of the most significant foods of prophetic people. When you eat it, your eyes will open. Ask any great prophet in the world. And they'll tell you, I eat honey on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And especially before they go to fight battles, they eat honey. Alright? Because Deborah defeated the enemy. Deborah is a bee that produces honey. Okay? So honey is a prophetic word. If you're watching me, and you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, I want you to say this prayer after me. You need to get saved. Jesus is coming soon. Let this Christmas be your Christmas of salvation. So say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and rose again for my justification. Today I receive you as Lord and Savior. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I'm now saved. Glory to Jesus. You have received salvation. Jesus is within you. The sweetness of his goodness and his kindness are all within you. Nothing can defeat you. Thank you so very much for tuning in, those of you who've been watching us. It's a beautiful Christmas season. Enjoy yourself. Uh, Karen says the best about this couple. They love each other. They share the word of God. The Father. They are ever neat. And they don't have the stories of M-Pesa Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the lady loves her mother-in-law. It's not so easy. Merry Christmas. Thank you, my dear. We love you so very much. Mm. Yeah. We, when we want money, we do business. We eat honey, then we go for business. We make lots of money, then we just come and preach. We don't disturb you about this and that. But it doesn't mean we don't receive gifts, surely. Yeah? Gifts are beautiful. If you love somebody, you send them gifts. Mm -hmm. This is how we preach about giving. If you want to give, give because you love that person. Mm -hmm. Not because all the Impesa number is down there, bank account details are there. No. Give out of love. If you sincerely love somebody, it's automatic. It's natural to give to them money, help, and all that. Okay, mm. and he's not. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it is. <laughs> Daisy, God bless you. Merry Christmas. Belinda, she says, I love you guys. We love you too. Evelyn, God bless you. Merry Christmas. Uh, Jack Ogola, God bless you. Uh, who else do we have? Miss Girl, she sent us so many beautiful things. Love you. That's our precious daughter, yeah? yeah? You know, she's learning to write and to read and everything. So she's practicing. So beautiful. And then who else do we have? Uh, Wilson saying, keep up the good work. All right. And the rest of you. We love you so much, guys. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We shall be talking on wisdom for finances. Okay? Till next time. Bye-bye.